chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. I'm going to start reading at verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Read these next verses with me on the screen. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. That's it. All right. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus wanted a snack, and you may be seated. So for Palm Sunday and Easter, I took a break from the Led by Fire series so we could concentrate on the events surrounding Easter, and I called the series Thank You, Jesus. And this week, my wife said, oh, you should do one more week on that series. And I said, no, honey, that's not the plan. I'm going back to this other series. And then God said, listen to your wife. <laughs> so I'm sticking with Thank You, Jesus, and, and that works for me uh, on several levels, partly because Miss Linda made these beautiful arrangements here for Easter, and I wanted to leave it up one more week because it's just so, so beautiful. And so that, that kind of works with the whole theme. Um, and then we got to do that Thank You, Jesus, for the blood. And I thought people would be sick of it. And I told the worship team, I'm like, after today, we'll take a, few, a break from it for a few weeks. And their reaction was, aw. Like, seriously, you want to sing that every... Okay. Um, but the series is called Thank You, Jesus, partly because of the song and, and because it really fits the theme. If Jesus never did another thing for us, we could still never thank him enough for just what he did. What he did at the end of his ministry, those, those few days from... From, the, from going to his crucifixion to his resurrection and the events surrounding that, that is, that's, he's done enough. If he never did another thing, um, I could still thank him every day for the rest of my life. So now for a little context. For those of you who haven't been paying attention, we just walk with Jesus through the events of Palm Sunday. He entered the city triumphantly to the shouts of Hosanna. He had the, the Last Supper followed by his betrayal his arrest, and of course, the crucifixion. And then last week, we had Easter Sunday. Jesus rose from the dead, much to the surprise of pretty much everyone, even though he had predicted it. Uh, he had said, I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to have to, to have to suffer many things, and then I'm going to be killed, and I will rise from the dead. And they were like, oh, he's probably speaking metaphorically. It's a figure of speech. He's using hyperbole. Which you can understand, because Jesus often did speak metaphorically. Sometimes he did use hyperbole. But he told them literally, I'll be betrayed, handed over, killed, and I will rise again on the third day. Now, in the beginning of Luke 24, the angels at the, at the tomb asked the ladies who were looking for him. They said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you? while he was still with you in Galilee. And you'll notice this next verse is in double quotes. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Ah, he literally told you this would happen. Now, the ladies run to tell the disciples about this, but do the disciples listen to the ladies? No, no. Back then... People didn't listen to women all the time. It's not like today, where women are never ignored or dismissed. It was bad back then. But ladies, we all listen to you now, right? Okay, yes, yes, yeah. Nod so that your husband feels like, like the man. Okay, all right. So that they dismiss the women, silly women. Peter runs to the tomb. Um, I love John because I think more than any of the other uh, Gospels, John puts more of himself into the Gospel. Like, you see more of his own thing. Because John's like, yeah, well, Peter ran, but I ran too, and I was faster. <laughs> Look it up. John literally says, he's like, yeah, we both ran, but I beat him. John wants us to know he's faster than Peter. So, 
Luke cuts from the interaction with the ladies at the tomb to another scene. There's a couple of Jesus' disciples, and they're walking on the road to Emmaus. Emmaus is about 20 miles away, and people got around mostly by walking. And Jesus shows up on the road and starts talking with them. Um, they had come to Jerusalem for the, the Passover, and then all of this other stuff happens. Jesus is crucified, and they're walking along, and they're looking like, you know, just something terrible has happened. They're just looking sad. They're looking, they got the Eeyore thing going. You know what I mean? The tail is down. They're walking slowly. And Jesus just pops in and is like, hey, boys, what's going on? And they're like, oh, not much. And he's like, wow, why are you so sad? You guys look so down. And he's like, well, haven't you heard? And, and Jesus keeps them from recognizing him. I love post-resurrection Jesus because he's always doing fun stuff. Like post-resurrection Jesus is just, he's just a party. He's just, it's a great time with post-resurrection Jesus. And he keeps them from recognizing him. And he, and he kind of plays dumb with him. He's like, no, I don't know what's going on. What's going on? And so they tell him, he's like, oh man, haven't you heard? There's this prophet named Jesus. We thought he was the one, man. We thought he was the Messiah. He was going to deliver us. We had hoped that he was going to be it. But then he was crucified and died. And that was kind of a bummer. And now some of the women are saying that his body is missing and that angels told him, them that he rose from the dead. And it just, none of this makes sense. And Jesus is like, hey, don't you guys study scripture? They're like, yeah, yeah, we, we study scripture. Well, have you read the prophets? And they're like, what do you mean? And Jesus is like, it's all there. The prophets say that the Messiah must first suffer and then enter his glory. And so Jesus walks them through the Old Testament scriptures about himself. Imagine being there. Wouldn't it be cool if Jesus showed up and gave you a Bible study lesson? He starts, starts leafing through the Old Testament. And he's like, all right, let's go here. Here's a little bit from Isaiah. And then he goes again. That's, that's about the Messiah. And then Psalms. He's like, okay, see here what it said in Psalms? It said, yeah, the Messiah is going to suffer. Oh, you know what? Isaiah really nailed it. Isaiah's really got a whole bunch about how he's going to be a suffering servant. Like you all are looking for a conquering king, but if you read it, Isaiah plainly told you that he was going to suffer at the hands of the government and that he was going to bear the weight of sin and he was going to take the punishment on himself. And Jesus walks them through all of these prophecies. Uh, man, I, I love David Jeremiah, but wouldn't it be cool to get a prophecy lesson from Jesus? I think that would be really neat. And so he walks them through all of this, and then they start to get to the village, and Jesus pretends that he's going to keep going. And they're like, no, 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 you got to stay the night with us. It's late. It's starting to get dark. You should come in, stay with us, have a meal. And so Jesus is like, okay. And then the food is served, and they're all like, they put up, like, who's going to say the blessing? Not me, not me. And, and Jesus is like, okay, I'll say the blessing. And so Jesus, uh, he volunteers. He gives thanks, and he breaks bread. And at the moment he breaks bread, all of a sudden their eyes are open, and they're like, oh, it's, and then he disappears. Like, post-resurrection Jesus, you are so funny. Like, you just spent all this time, educated them in the scriptures, and then all of a sudden their eyes are open, and bam, he's just gone. So these guys, they are so excited. They're like, dude, that was Jesus. And they talk to each other, and like, all of a sudden they're like, man, when he was explaining the scriptures, like, didn't your heart just beat? Didn't your heart just want to leap out of your chest? Like, like something was happening. We, we could feel something happening on the road, but we didn't realize... It was Jesus. And it says, so they run back to Jerusalem. So I don't know. I, did they get all the way to Emmaus? Are they 20 miles down the road? The sun is setting, and then all of a sudden they're like, we got to tell the disciples. And so they take off running for Jerusalem. I don't, I don't know how all that worked out. But they got from wherever they were to Jerusalem a lot faster than they got from Jerusalem to wherever they were. So they run, and they go find uh, the 11 disciples. And you're saying, I thought there was 12 disciples. Well, there was, but we're missing one. If, if, if you missed that part of the story, um, you know, go back a couple weeks online and, and we'll explain it to you. Um, and they're going to add a 12th later, uh, but we're not going to talk about that. But he finds the 11, 
And, and they begin to tell the 11 disciples all about this. Like, oh, dude, we were on this road, and this dude shows up. We don't know who he is. He seems clueless at first because he doesn't know what's happened. But then all of a sudden, he's explaining Scripture to us, and, and all the you know, Old Testament prophets are just coming alive. And we're like, oh, dude, what's going on? And then we sit down, and he breaks bread. And as soon as he breaks bread, we're like, it's G. And then he's gone. And they explain all this. So the disciples are just like, wow, what, what, I don't know what's going on. All right, I need a couple of helpers to have, help me pass something out here. Okay, uh, Clint, thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Carrie, thank you for, for offering. I appreciate it. Uh, let, let everybody get one or two fish, and just hang on to your fish until everybody has been served. Uh, after everybody has been served, we will partake together. That's, that's a thing that we sing in church, right? Your mom ever say that, you know, hey, everybody sit down at the table, but wait, we'll all partake together. But that's something we say. So I'm passing out some, some fish here. And why am I passing out fish? Just so you remember this. I just want you to remember this week, the week that we got Swedish fish in church. And, and it'll spark something. And I hope that you remember something about, about this message. So these guys are explaining things to the, to the 11. Now, who are these guys that were on the road to Emmaus? They are two of Jesus' disciples. But I just thought those two ran and saw the 11. Did Jesus have 13 disciples? No, Jesus had over 100 disciples. If you read the scriptures, like he had the 12 that were with him all the time, but then there was uh, a little larger group and a few ladies that tagged along pretty much all the time. Then there was a little larger group of 72 that he sent out two by two. And then by the time we get to Acts, there's about 120 gathering around. So Jesus had a lot of disciples other than the 12 disciples. So these are two of Jesus' disciples. They've been following him and they've been listening to his ministry. Every time he shows up, they're, they're like super fans, okay? They don't just come to one stop on the tour. They, they're on every stop. They got the t-shirt. They got all the merch. They're in this thing. Um, and so they are here talking to the disciples. The, uh, the 11 disciples, they know these guys, right? That's why they let them in the door. And so uh, thank you here. I'll take, yeah. Don't leave them on the communion table. I think that would probably be sacrilege. Um, so... So they're telling these guys about that, and that's where we're at in the, in the scripture that I have today in, in 24, verse 36. While they were still talking about this, that's what they were talking about, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. I just think that's so cool. All of a sudden, Jesus, and the doors are probably locked. He just is there among them. And he's like, hey, guys, talking about me? <laughs> peace. And they're just, they don't know what to do. They're just staring dumbfounded. The scripture does not record any words of the disciples in this passage. They're just standing there. Their jaws are on the ground. Verse 37, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. This was not the reception Jesus is looking for. See, I think sometimes we forget that Jesus was fully human. We know he's fully God. But when Jesus came and lived among us, he was also fully human. He had the whole human experience. He had emotions and feelings and hunger. And he stands among them and he's like, peace, guys. And he's expecting this to be a great moment. And they're just ashen. They just don't know what to do. Jesus, at this point, he's feeling great. Okay? Like, usually after church, um, I, I go between two different states. Okay? Okay. Um, Eventually, I'm going to be so exhausted, I'm going to need a nap, okay, because I give a lot of energy. But I'm also a people person. So being with all of you, shaking all of your hands, seeing all of you, do you have to understand, for me, that's like adrenaline. And so after church, I'm usually talking really fast. I'm usually really excited. My wife is like, calm down. And because I'm just, I'm loud, I'm out there. And I feel like this is what Jesus is like. Jesus came, he lived 30 years began his ministry. For three and a half years, he did his ministry on earth. He chose his disciples. He does all these miracles. He's constantly fighting with the Pharisees, but he knows it's all leading to his moment of crucifixion. When they, they come to that moment, he tells the betrayer, hey, go do what you have to do. He knows it's coming. And then he goes out into the garden, 
and he's just in agony in prayer. And he's, he's just, he's agonizing, he's, he's sweating, and just like drops of blood. His disciples are falling asleep, and he's feeling abandoned and let down. You ever go through something really hard, and the people you thought were going to be there for you are just like, they just don't get it. You know, and they're just checking out. And he's like, guys, couldn't you pray with me? I'm like, this, this is, I've come to the, to the earth for this moment. But he knows it's going to be horrible. And so he asked the Father, Lord, if there's any other way, let this pass from me. But nevertheless, not your will, but thine be done. And then he suffers it. He's, he's whipped. His body is torn to shreds. They put nails through his hands and feet. They put him on a cross nearly naked, humiliated, and then he dies. And it's so gruesome. But then three days later, he's risen from the dead, and it's all gone. All the misery, all the price paid, it's all gone. He, he, all the pressure of th this moment. Imagine if you lived your entire life knowing it was going to end in a public, horrible, excruciating execution. Imagine the weight that would be on you. That weight is lifted now. Jesus is risen, and he's just excited. He's feeling awesome. He's feeling like I do after a morning at church. He's just like, he's so energized and pumped, and that he's popping in and popping out and showing up and explaining guys scripture, and he's doing all this, and he comes up in the middle, and he's like, hey, guys, how are you doing? And they're all like, it's a ghost. And Jesus is like, dude, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your mind? Verse 39, he goes, look, look at my hands, look at my feet. It's me. Touch me. And see, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. You see, I have. You can touch me. Why do you doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You see, it's okay. You can touch me. I'm not a ghost. When he had said them, he showed them his hands and feet. And then, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is this, 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 these next few verses. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? I find that so funny. Seriously, Jesus, you've just conquered death, hell, and the grave. What are you going to do next? He's like, I need a snack. I'm famished. Have you ever conquered death, hell, and the grave? It's exhausting. I mean, it takes a little out of you. He, he needs to replenish. And, and so, so did they give him a snack? Yes. Would you have given Jesus a snack? Well, let me ask you this. If... A few days earlier, if a week earlier, you had been walking with Jesus, Jesus was hungry, and he went to a fig tree. He was like, oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to get some figs. He saw the fig tree had no figs, and he cursed the fig tree, and it died. If you had been with Jesus at the fig tree, and Jesus asked you for a snack, you better believe you're going to find, I'll find a snack. I don't know. We got something somewhere. Don't curse me, Jesus. I will... <laughs> I saw the last thing that let you down. <laughs> okay, I will give you a snack. And so, uh, and so, so if Jesus asks you for a snack, you give him a snack. Verse 42, they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. You can eat your fish if you want. So they're all astonished, and Jesus, they're all just ashen. They're thinking to ghosts. They're not sure what's going on. And Jesus is just really casually like, man, I'm starved. You got to get, get a snack? Oh, man, it's good, yeah. Oh, yeah, broiled fish. Like, yeah, we had a lot of fish here in the first century. Okay. I just love it. They're still standing there in amazement. No words of the disciples are recorded. And while Jesus waits for their brains to catch up with their eyes, he's like, you know what? I'm hungry. Rising from the dead is exhausting. Walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus is exhausting. Um, I never did get to eat because, you know, he broke the bread and disappeared. So he didn't even get a bite of the bread before, you know, he, he, I don't know if he's thinking to himself, maybe I should eat a little bread before I disappear because I'm starved. And then he flew back here. And, uh, and, and post-resurrection Jesus is so interesting when you read the scriptures because, like, on one hand, he's, he's supernatural. He can go through walls and he can go from here to here and do this. On another hand, he's human. He's hungry and wants some fish to eat and says, you can touch me, and he's got scars. It's just very, very interesting. So he starts munching on the fish sticks. And it just, it just reminded me of like all the times my brother would come home. You know, Maybe my brother came home from football practice, or maybe he'd been away for a few days, or 
And, and he'd just walk in the house, and he'd be like, hi, Mom, hi, Dad, and he'd go to the fridge and just start eating whatever was in the fridge. And that, that's where Jesus is at. He, he, he's, just like, he's just like, man, I'm hungry. And why do I love this passage so much? I love it because Jesus is fully God, but he's also a real dude who got hungry after a long walk. And it also speaks to me of the truth of this encounter. Okay, people are like, can I trust the Bible? Is it real? Well, when you read a passage like this, let me ask you, would you write that if that didn't happen? Who would make that up? Um, it, there's odd details if you're making up the story. Now, this part is written by Luke. And if you know Luke, Luke is a friend of Paul. And Luke didn't know Jesus firsthand. So he's, he knows from Paul and from hanging out with the disciples. And so Luke, he's a writer. So he comes back in and, and he says, okay, I've, I've got a, he's, got a, he's got a rich benefactor. He's going to pay him to write a couple books. And he writes Luke, Luke and Acts. And so he comes and he starts doing interviews. And he interviews the different disciples, the different people that knew Jesus. And so Luke comes in and he probably asks them, hey, what was it like when you saw Jesus again? And uh, Thomas is like, you know what? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe Thaddeus. Thaddeus never gets any shout out. So maybe Thaddeus is, is like, oh, dude, I get, let me tell you about it. The doors were locked, and Jesus just appears. And we're all just standing there dumbfounded. And Jesus is like, what's the big deal? It's just me. And then he's like, I'm hungry. So he starts munching on fish like it's no big deal. And we're just watching this happening. We're just like, is this really happening? Is, 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 is Jesus our, our rabbi, our leader, the one we thought that was, is he really alive and among us? And this is such a monumental thing in history. And Jesus is munching on fish like it's snack time. And, and, and we're all just watching it. Um, I, I also love this, the story in John. I used this last, last year when I preached. Um, in, in John, it talks about another time where the disciples are out fishing and they're not catching anything. And Jesus shows up, but again, they don't know it's Jesus. And Jesus does one of these things. Hey, guys, why don't you try throwing the nets on the other side of the boat? Well, does that sound familiar? That's what Jesus did at the beginning of his ministry with Peter, right? So they throw the net on the other side of the boat, and all of a sudden they have a miraculous catch of fish. And they're like, oh, we know what's going on here. That dude is Jesus, okay? So they take off for the shore, and when they get to the shore, what do they find? Jesus has a little fire, and he's cooked breakfast for them. I mean, isn't that cool? Why did Jesus do that? Was there a monumental lesson in history? Or did Jesus actually like these guys and want to hang out with them? And I think, I think that's one of the, the big lessons that, that I, uh, I learned last year when going through these passages, is we all know Jesus loves you, right? Do you know Jesus likes you? Like, I think most of us feel like Jesus loves us, but he doesn't really like us. He kind of puts up with us. No, Jesus likes you. He likes you. He wants to hang out with you. And so um, this year, what do we learn? What, what can we, one more, one more take at this thank you Jesus thing. What, what can we learn um, from Jesus? What, we, what can we thank Jesus for in this uh, post-resurrection edition? Number one is this. Thank you, Jesus, for the assurance. The assurance. Jesus really existed. He, really, this, he was a real person that really existed. Do you know that a, 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 a good atheist who's really studied all of the angles and wants to debate with you, that, that atheist won't argue with you that Jesus existed? Because it's a historical fact. Because, first of all, the Bible is a great history book. So... You know, when people are like, yeah, it's only in the Bible. Well, it's, the Bible is an ancient document recording history. I don't know why people dismiss it. But there are other ancient historians that record this person named Jesus in the first century. He, he really existed. There really was a man named Jesus. In one interesting account, there's, there's one guy who's like, yeah, and right at the, the time that this Jesus died, all of a sudden darkness covered the land. And a hundred years later, somebody quotes him and, sa and says, hey, you know what we figured out? That was an eclipse. Ah, there's going to be an eclipse tomorrow. So, yeah. Um, so uh, that's recorded in history. Um, 
Jesus, but the other, you know, the thing is, is that Jesus, he didn't rise from the dead and then suddenly take off. I love that he stuck around for a while. It was about 40 days that Jesus stuck around and spent time just popping in and out of people's lives. And I think so much of the New Testament is richer because Jesus spent that time and explained to people the Old Testament prophecies about himself. That, that's why Matthew and John have so much rich uh, reference to prophecy is because Jesus had spent that time teaching other, opening up the Old Testament scriptures and showing people that he was the Messiah that had been prophesied. According to Paul, one time he appeared to a crowd of over 500 people. And, and Paul's like, hey, a lot of those people are still alive to this day. So Paul met Jesus uh, after his ascension. Jesus appeared to Paul. He had a little, you know, come to Jesus moment on the, the road to Damascus. But Paul has talked to a lot of other people that saw Jesus after the resurrection, and a lot of them are still alive years later. And because Jesus showed himself to so many people, they believed. You know, the Gospels initially record the disciples hiding. They're sad. They're fearful. They think everything was lost. Even though Jesus had told them he'd rise again, they were, they were just, they were just, all, they were sure that this was the end of things, that this had ended badly. And then the reports came in that he was alive, and nobody believed it. Nobody believed that Jesus was alive until Jesus shows up, until they see Jesus. Even Thomas, after all of his good buddies are like, oh, Jesus is alive, we saw him. Thomas is like, oh, well, I see his hands and feet. And then later, Jesus pops in the room and is like, Thomas, you want to see my hands and feet? And he's, Thomas is just embarrassed. He's like, no, Lord, I'm sorry. But he didn't believe until he saw Jesus. The men didn't believe the ladies. Thomas didn't believe the men. Maybe they all made it up. So why would they make up a story and then show themselves as unbelieving, as fearful? If I was going to make up the story that Jesus rose from the dead, if I was going to lie about the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, I would portray myself way much better. I would be like, yep, I knew it all along. I believe, I just was waiting three days because he said he'd be back, and sure enough, he's back. I, I'd be like that. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be writing myself this embarrassing thing where I'm hiding behind locked doors, not believing everybody, and Jesus has to show up through a wall and nibble on some fish before I believe him. I wouldn't record that. It, 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 it speaks to the authenticity of the story, the fact that that the people writing the story show themselves in a very bad light. I've used this illustration before because all the disciples, they died for this story. They never relented. They, some of them lived a few years, some of them lived many years. Not one of them ever went back and said, oh, we made that up, that's a lie. And I love what Chuck Colson said years ago. Chuck Colson was one of the, the president's men during the Watergate scandal. Let me explain for the people under 40 here. Watergate was a big political scandal in Washington, D.C., where a bunch of Republicans broke into the Democratic headquarters uh, to, to steal some stuff and find out all their strategies, and then, uh, and then they lied about it and, and pretended they hadn't. And Chuck Colson was one of those guys, and he writes this. He, he, in prison, he later became a Christian, and he started a whole prison ministry. But Chuck Colson said, he said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Well, because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep the lie together for three weeks. You tell me that 12 apostles, and think about who the apostles are. They're fishermen. They're from a little backwater town. They're hicks. you telling me these 12 apostles could keep a lie together for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Did Jesus rise from the dead? You can be sure of it. So thank you for the assurance. Number two, thank you, Jesus, for the promises. After 40 days, Jesus left through the clouds. We have the ascension, but he left us with two great promises. And let me tell you what they are. 
first one is the Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus had predicted this before his death. And John, he tells the disciples, hey, it's good for you that I'm going away because when I go away, then I can send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And he uses the word uh, paraclete. It's the one who literally comes alongside. If you parse that Greek word, paraclete is one who comes alongside. So in Jesus, we have Emmanuel, God with us, right? And Jesus says, okay, yeah, I'm with you now, but if I go away, you get to have the one who comes alongside. We go from God with us to God in us. That, that God will walk in us. He will be part of, uh, part of our lives. We talk about asking Jesus into our hearts, or we talk about you know, the Holy Spirit. That after Jesus, after the resurrection, Jesus says, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for the Holy Spirit, because you're going to be my witnesses. In the Great Commission in Matthew, he says, I will be with you to the ends of the earth, right before he ascends. Now, that doesn't make sense. Jesus is like, I'm with you to the ends of the world, and then he disappears through the clouds. What's happening? He's Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, go into all the world, and I'm going to be with you through the Spirit. So, thank you, Jesus, for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And the other promise, um, famous Arnold Schwarzenegger line, I'll be back. Jesus promised he would return. In John, he tells the disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I will be back to come get you. Well, when is Jesus going to be coming back? Anybody think he's coming back tomorrow during the eclipse? I hope so. Uh, that would be great. Um, I'm pretty sure he's not, but I hope I'm wrong. Um, uh, here's a few thoughts about the eclipse, okay? Are, are any of you going to travel to go see the eclipse? Anybody traveling to the, because we're, we're not in the shadow, Nobody traveling to go see the eclipse? All right. Myron, you're going to go take a plane over there? There you go. Okay. Um, so uh, some people have been asking. So let me tell you a few things about the eclipse. First of all, eclipses happen about every 18 months. So this really isn't that special a thing, except that it's crossing Texas. And, you know, so if... if the center, if, if Bible prophecy is speaking mainly about Texas, then there's a good thing. And I've been a Texan now for nearly 20 years, and I'm really okay with the thought that Texas is the center of the universe. I'm really okay with that. I have a Texas-shaped waffle maker at my house, okay? I'm a Texan. But this eclipse isn't special just because it crosses Texas. Also, when Jesus comes, I don't think it's going to be through an eclipse because the Bible says that every eye will see him. And not every eye is going to see the eclipse. Only people in North America, as it crosses us, will see this eclipse. Um, but in Revelation 1, 7, it says every eye will see him. And also Jesus said on more than one occasion, nobody knows the hour. You don't know. Um, so good chances if you think he's coming, he's probably not. Well, what did Jesus say? In Luke 21, he said there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Now, that sounds like more than, a, than an eclipse. Um, heavenly bodies shaken? Um, and it says what is, people will be apprehensive from what is coming on the world, okay? We are going to have an eclipse that's going to cross Texas and several other states. Um, Jesus is talking about in Luke 21 things that will happen to the whole world, that the heavens will be shaken. If, if we start to look at the stars and all of a sudden they start changing, okay, the Big Dipper all of a sudden be, you know, becomes a fork, I, you know, I don't know. It, it, <laughs> The whole world starts shaking. <coughs> and then look at the next verse. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things be begin to take place, stand up and lift your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So here's, here's some, some advice for you. If you think that the world is about to end, can I tell you something as Christians? That's good news. 
okay? And I, I get so frustrated when I see Christians like, I'm so worried the world's about to end. I'm like, no, that's great. That's the climax of the book. That's the thing we're waiting for. And, and Jesus himself says, when you see all this, when you see the world ending and the Son of Man coming on the clouds, he, what does he say? He said, hey, stand up, lift up your heads. Your redemption is drawing near. It's time to go. I, if I see Jesus coming on the clouds, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to be like, woohoo, here's the ride. Let's go. Let's do this. Are we seeing signs? You know, there's a lot of things going on right now. There was an earthquake in uh, New Jersey yesterday. There's an eclipse uh, tomorrow. Uh, today, we might see Iran attack Israel um, in return for an airstrike against some Hezbollah leaders in Syria a couple days ago. Um, so there's lots of things going on. There's lots of signs that could be happening. Should we be worried? No. Jesus said these are, these are just birth pains, okay? Uh, these, he's, he's like, I think if you were here today, you'd probably say those are Braxton Hicks contractions. Those are things that are going to have to happen. Uh, those are things that are going to have to happen before the end. You're just getting ready for the end, okay? If you don't know what Bra Braxton Hicks contractions are, um, the ladies who are going to give birth, they have those before the actual labor. It's kind of like they're, they're, they're getting a workout, getting ready for labor. And that's what Jesus said. He's just like, hey, these things are, you're just getting ready for the end. Um, so, you know, What's going to happen? Is, is the rapture going to happen? Are we going to go through some tribulation first? Okay. In the Assemblies of God, we believe the rapture will happen before the great tribulation. But we also know that Jesus promised that in this world you would have tribulation. So just because it's not the great tribulation doesn't mean you're not going to go through any tribulation. Okay. And if you've been on this earth for more than a few years, you've probably gone through some tribulation. But Jesus says there's lots more coming. Either way, it means Jesus is coming and that's a good thing. Christians shouldn't duck and cover. You don't need to get in your bunker, okay? Jesus tells Luke that when these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, your redemption is drawing near. I love the, the end of Revelation. At the end of Revelation, uh, Jesus says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. And the writer says, amen, come, Lord Jesus. That's what we want. It's the end of the world. Everybody's like, oh, no, it's the end of the world. You know what Christians' re response should be? Yes, all right, bring it on. So Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. He promised he'd come again. He uh, gave us his assurance. And lastly, thank you, Jesus, for the mission. What do, you, what do you do if you think Jesus is coming back soon? Be about the mission. In Matthew 28... Right before Jesus ascended, he came to them and said, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. The mission is clear. What was Jesus' mission? To seek and to save the lost. So what is our mission? It's the same. Well, no, Jesus didn't make disciples. Well, he said, go to all the world and make disciples. How do you make disciples? you got to make disciples out of people that don't yet follow Jesus and help them become Jesus followers. See, in the church, we tend to use the word discipleship to, to mean educating Christians. That's not the way Jesus used it. Jesus used discipleship as when he called people to follow him. And if we're going to make disciples, we need to be out in the world calling people to follow Jesus. That's our mission. Discipleship is evangelism, okay? You can disciple people before they know Jesus. Okay? Why, how? You're calling, you're calling people to follow Jesus. You're living life with them. You're going through life. You become that person in their life that they can go to when they're having problems. And you can lead them to following Jesus like you're following Jesus. You can be like Paul. Hey, follow, follow Jesus as I follow Jesus. Come follow me as I follow Jesus. Let's do this thing. All right. I'm going to leave myself a couple minutes at the end. Good news, Jesus is coming back. Probably not tomorrow, but maybe. If he does, cool. All right? If Jesus comes back tomorrow, um, probably will not be a midweek Bible study. Just, just for your calendars. Um, at least I won't be leading because I'm going with him. Uh, now, if, if you don't know Jesus, uh, this is a great time to get right with him. Okay? And so, like I do every week, I give you the opportunity. If you came into this place and you don't know the Lord, just begin to ask and just say, Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. I know I'm a sinner. 
Please forgive me of my sins and be my Lord. I, and just confess Jesus as Lord. And, and if you pray that prayer, just go tell somebody, you know what, I've decided to become a Jesus follower. You know, how do you become a Christian? You don't have to sign up to be a church member. You don't have to do anything. I think you should get involved in a church. But, but if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, and then you confess with your mouth, that, that's, that's the first sign of being a Christian, is telling somebody, hey, I've become a Jesus follower. And then go find a church, get plugged in, get baptized. But let me just pray, Lord, what are you speaking to us today? Lord, strengthen our faith. Give us assurance. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave any doubt about it. You showed yourself to hundreds of people. You stuck around. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to be about your mission. In Jesus' name, amen. Now stay seated for a moment. I'm going to close the online folks. So online folks, uh, thank you. Join us again Wednesday night, Bible study, 7 o'clock. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Farewell. You all stay here. I, I was thinking about this, um, the, this, the, this week. Somebody give me a thumbs up that we're offline here. We've ended the live stream. Working on it, okay. I, 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 I wanted to have a moment with you not on the live stream, and let me explain why. Because I have several people that I am discipling that don't yet attend this church. Some of them tune in and watch me. And sometimes I find out, oh, oh yeah, I saw your, saw your message on Sunday. We were there. Oh, I watched it with my wife and my mom, that kind of thing. And so I, I don't want them to hear this part, okay? Part, also, I want you to feel special that you came in person and didn't watch online. Um, but but here's, here's the thing that, that I wanted to talk about, this mission. I want to ask you, who are you discipling? Now, Jesus had 12 disciples. Let's not think 12. How about one? Can you do one disciple? Do you have one? Who is your one? And I'll probably talk about this more in the days ahead. Who is your one? I want to challenge you. Um, and I want to challenge this offline because I don't want my neighbors to know that they're my one. I've got some neighbors that I've been trying to disciple for five years, and I've been in their life, and I've, I've helped them, and, I've, you know, and, and sometimes they watch me. I don't want them to know that, that I, I am there. My, I'm trying to disciple them. Now, it wouldn't be a big secret if they found out I'm trying to disciple them because I talk about it all the time. Um, I, have, I have a contractor who worked in my house that I'm trying to work on discipling. Um, I'm praying for these people. I'm developing a relationship with them. I want to be that person in their life that they can go to. I want to genuinely love that. So when I talk about your one, I'm not talking about you starting a project. Nobody likes feeling like a project. Let me say that again. Don't, don't do it as a project. Nobody wants to be your project. But I pray that you have somebody in your life that does not yet know Christ, that you are intentional about forming a relationship with. You are intentional about being their friend. You are intentional about being that person of influence in their life. That, that when they're going through, through things, they're coming to you, and they're asking what they can do. They're, asking, they, they're gonna start asking you to pray for them. Even, even if they don't believe in Jesus, they're gonna be like, hey, can you pray for me? I'm going through this thing, okay? So I want to challenge each and every one of you, okay?